I'd like to acknowledge that this is uh, the public hearing for Iowa Palms. Today is Tuesday, April 23rd at 5.30 on the dot. I'd like to acknowledge that both the press and the public are duly notified in accordance with the Freedom of Information Act. The purpose of this meeting is we've got several things that need to have public hearings and input. The first of which is ordinance amending Title VII, Chapter 1, Business Licenses for the City of Isle Palms Code of Ordinances regarding the increase of short-term rental license fees. I'm going to ask Ms. Desiree if she would help us a little bit on this. All right. Okay, it is the public hearing, like the mayor stated, of Ordinance 2019-05, an ordinance amending Title VII, Chapter 1, business licenses of the City of Isle of Palms, Code of Ordinances, regarding the increase of short-term rental licenses. I'll quickly go through all of the ordinances and the resolutions and allow time for public comment afterwards. Um, Douglas is going to address Ordinance 2019-07. Um, the first ordinance in the uh, for public hearing is the increase of the short-term rental license fees um, these short-term rental license uh, fees apply for those properties that are, are rented for less than 90 days these fees have not increased since they were put in place in 2007 the current fees are um, have a base rate of hundred and seventy five dollars for revenues from zero dollars to two thousand dollars <clears throat> plus two point two dollars and thirty cents for each additional thousand or fraction thereof <clears throat> this ordinance would inc increase those fees to a base rate of three hundred and fifty dollars for the first two thousand dollars and um, an additional four dollars and sixty cents for each additional thousand um, of revenue or fraction the ordinance would take effect immediately upon approval by city council later this evening um, after um, approved by sec for second reading the estimated additional annual, annual revenue is expected at $480,000. The second ordinance that's up for public hearing is Ordinance 2019-06, an ordinance amending Title III Public Works, Chapter 3, Stormwater Regulations, Article A, Stormwater Management Utility, relative to increasing the um, NPDES stormwater fee. This would increase the existing rate, annual rate of $48 to $72. The additional revenue will be held by Charleston County and subject to reimbursement procedures for the city's stormwater and drainage related projects. <clears throat> the existing fee is $48, like I mentioned earlier, and this is, this is e e the base fee equals one ERU, which is a, an equivalent residential unit. And so it would increase, each ERU would increase by, um, from 48 to 72. The base fee for residential parcel, parcels equals one ERU, which is $72. Vacant parcels would be half of a ERU, which would be $36. And commercial parcels would be $72 per 3,000 square feet. Again, this would take effect immediately upon approval by council, and the estimated additional <coughs> annual revenue is $136,992. <clears throat> Douglas, do you want to come and talk about 2019-07? He's our Stony Administrator, and then I'll go ahead and discuss resolutions 2019-01 and 2019-02. Thank you. Um, this ordinance is a is a very simple ordinance in, in the text of what it does the the um, impact of it and the purpose of it is a little more complicated um, and I would say that that the ordinance is coming as a result of uh, and, and in concern of subdivision requests the purpose of the ordinance would be to reduce the potential for subdividing on the property and the concern and the reason why the city would consider doing this um, really ties back to drainage um, and impervious surfacing, the idea being that the more lots that are subdivided will equate to more residential structures, uh, and more residential structures would lead to more impervious surfacing. And with the existing drainage infrastructure, that, that more impervious surfacing could contribute to problems in terms of drainage. So that's, that's the purpose of the ordinance. Um, the text of the ordinance, what they do is they adjust the minimum lot size requirement for the two residential districts. There's SR1 and there's SR2. Those are our two districts. It would increase the SR1 requirement. That's the larger residential lots. That requirement is currently 17,500 square feet. This would adjust that to 
twice that to 35,000 square feet per lot. So somebody to subdivide a lot would have to have to get two lots. You'd obviously have to have 70,000 square feet to subdivide into two lots. Uh, the SR2 zoning district is the uh, that's the zoning district that has the smaller lots. Currently, that lot size requirement for SR2 is 8,000 square feet, and this this um, code would double that as well to go to 16,000 square feet per lot. Um, the Planning Commission has reviewed these amendments, recommends that you will uh, adopt the amendments, um, and I would just say, tack on to that, that, and if you look at the minutes, you will see that the Planning Commission had th their primary concern, and I think a lot of the focus of their discussions was on the fact that this change will make a lot of the properties on the island non-conforming. That, by and large, is not problematic. Um, you can build on non-conforming lots. You have all of the same rights uh, that you would have on a non-conforming lot that you would as on a conforming lot. Uh, but the concern would be that when, when a property is non-conforming, you actually get a reduction in front and rear setbacks. So for SR1, that would go from 30 to 24 for those properties that are made non-conforming. And for SR2, that goes from 25 to 20. So um, I, the, the Planning Commission did recommend approval of it. There was concern about that non-conforming issue. Uh, I would urge the Council to consider um, sending it back to the Planning Commission uh, to, to really drill down on that particular issue to see if um, some adjustments could be made to to deal with that change. Having had the public hearing tonight um, and it's on your agenda, that would have the effect of um, putting the pending ordinance doctrine in place and it would make this ordinance have the effect of, of law even though if you were to not to ratify it tonight, it would have the effect of law if the Planning Commission were to continue looking at it. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Donald. You'll be back up later. <laughs> okay, the last two items on the public hearing agenda is the resolution 2019-01 to increase franchise fees with Comcast from 3% to 5%. The city entered into a franchise agreement with Comcast back in 20, 2010 and the rate established at that time was 3%. All of the franchise agreements that the city has with other utility companies are at 5%. So this was presented as an, uh, an alternate revenue generating opportunity for the city to make it equal um, with other utility providers. <clears throat> the estimated additional revenue for this change would be 72,472. The last resolution is the to increase the building permit fees. This. Um, addresses our request to standardize the building permit process, which would um, include an incremental rate for all projects at a base rate of $50, rather than um, depending on the building value, plus $5 per $1,000 of project building value. So we would be changing the methodology of how building permits are established, rather than giving a bigger discount for larger and more valuable projects, it um, it is consistent to the building permit, to the building value, and the uh, project value. Again, this change is expected to roughly increase revenues by, by approximately $120,000. Um, that's it for us. Um, I think it, now it's time to have yep. to see whether or not we, we have public speak comment. Up here. This is time for the public to speak. So has anybody got any comments concerning any of these um, ordinances? Hearing none. Uh, Mr. Clark wants to speak later. I'm sorry. Thank you. I missed your hand. It's a late hand. <laughs> um, I also have a copy of a plat. If you can, I just pass. Oh, sure. Mr. Clark, name and address, please. Okay. Uh, thank you. My name is Philip Clark. And I live at 126 Carolina Boulevard. I've lived there for the past 18 years. I'm an attorney and I've practiced law in Charleston and Mount Pleasant for the past 34 years. Um, I've represented clients before city council and before county council on this type of issue, but this is the first time I've appeared before you. The reason I'm appearing tonight is that I'm appearing on behalf of my sister, Ann Clark, who owns 126 Carolina. And I wish to voice her opposition to the proposed 2009, excuse me, 2019-07 regarding the lot subdivisions. 
Um, in the year 2000, my parents, who were then owners of two adjacent lots at 124 and 126 Carolina, and those are lots 17 and 16 on the plat you have in front of you, um, combined these two lots in order to build a residence on that property. Each lot was 78,000 square feet as it had been originally platted on the Isle of Palms plat. When we contacted the Planning Commission about returning the two lots to their original size, it's when we learned that the city now has a, requires a minimum of 8,000 square feet for each of those lots. Um, we've since been negotiating with the owner of lot 13, and again, if you refer to the plat, that's the lot directly behind lot 16 and 17, for the purchase of the additional 400 square feet. Now, just um, being able to obtain the 400 square feet is certainly not going to win automatically win the approval of the city but that's the first step that we have to meet in order to bring the lots into a conforming size um, in the event that this ordinance is passed and the minimum lot size goes to 16,000 square feet we're effectively put out of the running for what we're trying to do of increasing just by the 400 square feet um, I certainly understand the numerous practical issues and the policy issues concerning lot subdivision especially as it relates to drainage issues. Um, but in thinking about this this afternoon, what I decided was passing an ordinance which doubles the required lot size is like using a minnow, to a minnow net to catch crabs. You just don't need to make it that well defined and without realizing and considering the effect it will have on lots like ours where we're just trying to get back to the minimum lot size. So I would ask you to um, would to consider that um, and for the reasons I would request that you defeat the ordinance or at least send it back to committee for consideration of this specific point. Anyone have any questions? Really, it's, it's okay, my turn. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else like to speak? Hearing none, I'm going to call this uh, public hearing to to adjourn, sir. Mm -hmm. oh. Was it just public speaking or just those resolutions? Z just for this portion of it. Then we're going to have council, which will have citizens' comments at that time, unless you've got something on one of these yeah, resolutions. Those resolutions. Thanks, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Hearing none, we're going to adjourn. I'd like to welcome everybody here today. It's a great crowd we have. This is All Palm City Council. It's 6 p.m. Tuesday, April 23rd. I'd like to acknowledge that both the press and the public were duly notified in accordance with the Freedom of Information Act. Please feel free to join me as I say a prayer to be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance and then our roll call. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you on behalf of all who are gathered here tonight. I thank you for this wonderful time of the year of resurrection for all faiths. I ask you to look over all who are sick and who have lost loved ones. I ask that you look over our, and protect our military who protect us and others around the world, and our public safety personnel who protect us 24-7, 365, and our city family who work tirelessly for our city island paradise. I thank you for life itself and for our individual liberties and freedom of speech. I pray that all who share this planet learn to respect each other's beliefs religions, and learn to get along with each other. I ask that you for your guidance and wisdom tonight uh, in governing our city and making the decisions that affect our residents and visitors for not only now, but for future generations. It is in your name I pray, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Marie Copeland, our city clerk, would you please do roll call? <laughs> Council Member Bell? Here. Council Member Buchanan? Here. Council Member Ferenz? Here. Council Member Kinghorn? Here. Council Member Moy? Here. Council Member Rice? Here. Council Member Smith? Here. Council Member Ward? Here. Mayor Carroll. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> well, we're glad to have you. <laughs> Interim Administrator Fragoso. Here. And Attorney Copeland. Here. Thank you very much. 
Uh, next order of business is a reading of the journals of previous meetings. I wish I could tell you how many meetings we've had this past month. But we're going to start with just two of them. The regular meeting of March 26, 2019, and special meeting of April 2nd, 2019. Do I hear a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Any discussions, corrections? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? Unanimous. Citizens comments. We've got a couple big things on, so we're going to start with our residents first. So, residents, uh, who wants to come first? Yes, sir. Thanks, sir. Name and address. Oops, I didn't do it. I didn't do it either. <laughs> My name is Steve Little. I'm actually in between two homes on Isle of Palms. One is 6 Intracoastal Court, and one is 1149th Avenue. Yes, sir. Thank you. When I was born over 40 years ago, it was by the grace of God my parents brought me home to 22nd Avenue in Isle of Palms. Since then, I've lived on 27th, 32nd, owned a lot in Forest Trail, and currently own two homes outside the gates, one of which directly overlooks the marina and is adjacent to Tideway Water Sports. Do we have traffic issues at the marina? Yes. Every marina in town does on a beautiful weekend. Drive over to Mount Pleasant to Rimley Point Boat Landing on a beautiful Saturday. They overflow the paved lot into the grass lot and then spill over and line the streets. Go over to James Island to Wapu Creek Boat Landing and you see boat trailers backed up the grass embankment of the bridge itself. It's the nature of the beast. Do we need a fishing pier? Isle Palms residents are not lacking for access to water. Secondly, the tidal wave pier is particularly incompatible with, pier, with fishing and to say otherwise would be ignorant on the subject. Before these current owners, Highway Water Sports is owned by Mr. Berrigan. Before that, two young entrepreneurs by the name of Steve and Billy lived on Palm Boulevard and also owned the Subway Sandwich Shop across the street. Tidal Wave is a part of this island, not only bringing tourism dollars, license fees, revenues, taxes, but they are a responsible tenant that's willing to commit to a long-term and profitable lease for the city. Their customer base also positively impacts the island businesses. But the primary benefit, sadly, often overlooked, is the number of high school and college-age kids that are employed every single year by Tidal Wave Water Sports, which now the numbers have to be in the thousands. Introduction to basic accounting, cash tills, closing of the registers, batch reports, matching up gross receipts, the importance of equipment maintenance and repairs, scheduling of personnel, not to mention the logistics of wave runners coming in, going out, wakeboard lessons, boat, boat tours, parasailing. It's a logistics nightmare that our kids are learning how to manage. These are skills that are taken into the workplace in the future. Not only that, but we have the customer relations of, yes, you've been out in the sun in 110 degree heat index for six hours, but that customer coming down the dock is to be treated like royalty. Why? Because your job depends on it, your tips depend on it, and you pray that they have such a good time that they come back and bring friends with them. I know this firsthand. I'm currently the president of Maritime Services of Charleston, the largest crew boat company in Charleston. I also own Tow Boat US Charleston, carry a 100 ton master's license, which I received working the fuel dock at Isle of Palms Marina. But my first job on the water was a deckhand on a parasail boat in Tidal Wave Water Sports. I love this island. I'm proud to be from this island. I'm blessed to live on this island. And my island supports great organizations that benefit the community across the spectrum, such as Tidal Wave Water Sports. Thank you. Next? Yes, sir. May I speak? Yes, sir. Please come up. Yeah. Mr. Rusty. No pad. That's really good. Name and address, please. My name is Rusty Rusty. I'm from Tidal Wave Water Sports. 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 And you know, this is the first time that I've been here in this decade, so I did not want this decade to disappear without Rusty showing up. But it, it's kind of, I enjoy coming to a place where I don't know everybody and I get to meet a lot of new friends and that's what happened tonight. And I, and I, and I want to direct it to you folks primarily here at City Council. And that is that 
you know, I want to thank you, every one of you who are on the city council and, and the mayor here, uh, because you folks embody really being a public servant. You're not on here for the money, you're on here to serve. And, and those of you who I really talked to when uh, you were running for election, you really convinced me that you were running to be on city council to make a difference. And I really, I appreciate that too, I really do. So I just want to say that. And uh, and I'm, I'm here tonight, it sort of reminded me listening to the Steve Little speak just then. It kind of reminded me if you go to maybe a function and uh, maybe it's a Christian function, uh, somebody just, I mean, is praying and, and everything is just, they're going the way it should go and the minister gets up and you know he's getting ready to preach a long sermon and he really should just say amen you know and sit down well that's sort of what I feel like after Steve Little got through <laughs> I'm, I'm just here as they say in the law as a character witness and I want to come here and just speak on behalf of, of Michael and Mark the tidal wave and just to, to say that these two, to me, embody the, the, the spirit that we are looking for here at the Isle of Palms. They are community-oriented people that try to do their best, and that's, that's why I'm here. I'm not trying to give you a lot of facts like what Steve did, but he did a great job. So I just want to tell you all that I'm here just to speak as a character witness for these fellas, and, and I appreciate the way they run their business. I know you all do, too, and I've heard sort of through the grapevine that y'all are trying to work out something, and I'm so grateful to hear that too. That and maybe it might not be exactly what the city wants, exactly what they want, but I know it's coming together, and I really appreciate that. So anyway, thank you guys, thank you ladies, and thank y'all for sure. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Oh, God. <laughs> Okay, maybe this will be the other side of the equation here a little bit. Um, Scott Pierce, I live at 4 9th Avenue. I'd like to address the opportunity to follow through on creating an IOP public access to the Intercoastal Waterway. As background, this fiscal year the Marina Fund is operationally budgeted to lose $347,000, draining our tax dollars at a rate of roughly $1,000 a day. This effectively means the IOP residents are subsidizing the commercial operations of non-resident third parties. This does not include the projected millions of dollars in repairs for IOP's marina, buildings, and docks. The guiding principle of the IOP marina is that it was purchased to provide the residents and community access to the water, not subsidize commercial operations while accepting the burden of continuously deteriorating facilities. A few points to consider. There is no public parking or access to the water available without doing business with the resident subsidized commercial enterprises. Comments by Marina tenants at the last real property committee meeting clearly indicated an intent to continue resident subsidized commercial growth as fast as possible. Based on discussions in ways and means in real property, there exists significant OCRM and Army Corps of Engineer violations at the marina. IOP bought the marina in 1999 for $4.25 million via public referendum in an overwhelming vote. It was purchased for public access. Since then, city councils with no apparent experience in commercial leases failed in nearly every aspect of the leases when compared to any market-based benchmark. Council then voted 7-2 to two to extend an existing non-market-based lease for yet another 30 years. There are no protections in the leases limiting the number of businesses, so tenants have expanded their returns with dozens of subleases and other entities that bring in money that can potentially circumvent IOP's coffer. The current lease with Tidal Wave Water Sports is not consistent with Marina Guiding Principle or even close to approaching a market-based arrangement. Unless you are in a partnership, specifically include and or restrict <coughs> all related entities and subleases or have total control over expenses in the books, no third party should enter into a percent of gross profit or net lease. It's simply irresponsible. Why has IOP received the same meager $21,000 per year payment for the past five years as the business and revenues appear to have grown with the rest of the robust economy? The answer, there is no answer backed by audible financial statements. All an owner has to do in a situation like this is increase expenses to oneself or outboard revenues. 
happens all the time. It's likely legal and difficult to fault any owner for leveraging IOP's inexperience and neglect in auditing the financials. For prior council meeting minutes, Mayor Cronin moved to notify Tidal Wave Water Sports that the city does not intend to renew their lease. Council Member Carroll seconded that and said, quote, the city has a marina that has outgrown itself, end quote. That was 2017. IOP should not be in the commercial real estate business, nor should our taxes subsidize it. It's clearly not an IOP core competency, nor will it ever be. The action of council should be evident. Vote to finally send notice now to indicate the current lease will not be renewed. It's a bust for residents to continue to subsidize marina commercial operations. Council can then deliberately determine the best course of action to achieve the marina goals on behalf of the residents and stop the IOP taxpayer subsidies. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Scott. Mr. Pierce. Yes. Can I have a copy? Yes, of course you can. More mm -hmm. residents. Anyone else? Thank you, thank yes, you. Sir. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. My name is Bill Campbell. My wife and I live at number 34 on 42nd Avenue on the Isle of Palms. My wife and I attended the council meeting last week, and we would like to share some observations regarding the meeting. We were surprised at the amount of time that was spent pursuing non-resident issues. In fact, we were surprised that the tone of the city council was still focused on attracting visitors to our island. Why do we need to spend time and money on attracting visitors to the Isle of Palms? We all know this is the closest beach. Where else are people going to go? Folly? I think uh, someone during the meeting said that we give the Charleston Visitor Visitors and Convention Bureau around $500,000 to promote the IOP. Why? These non-residents will visit the island whether we promote it or not. And frankly, haven't we reached capacity on summer weekends? Traffic is horrid. Parking is crazy. Driving to and from the island in summer is nuts. You have to plan your drive into Mount Pleasant or be stuck in traffic for a couple of hours. Our police are overwhelmed, parking attendants are in a tizzy. Will this ever end? What is the official capacity of the island? I think we've exceeded it. As Donald Trump <coughs> says in the southern border, we're full, go back. <laughs> I'm, afraid, I, I'm afraid I long for the good old days. Having been a property owner since 1986, I've seen too many changes. I've mentioned to City Council before that we were attracted to the layback style on the Isle of Palms. Remember we had to cross Breach Inlet over to Sullivan's Island, then cross the Ben Sawyer to get off the island. If a sailboat was traveling the intercoastal waterway, it could take you three hours to get into Mount Pleasant. And we lived in Charlotte at the time, so it was a long trip. Um, you remember, remember when we had to go to Mount Pleasant to get drinking water for Pete's sake? Those were special times, and I want to do everything in my power to slow progress and even reverse it if possible. I don't want to attract visitors. I don't want entertainment attractions on marina property. It's a marina first and foremost. I too am a licensed cap co Coast Guard captain. Yeah, we shouldn't have a kite flying boat business. I've never wanted to kite behind a boat. If you want those kinds of activities, please take a pleasant drive to Myrtle Beach they specialize in those kinds of activities. While we're on the subject, I don't, I don't want short-term renters. Short-term renters have turned our neighborhood into a rental hood, not a neighborhood. Things are not the same on our street. I don't know the short-term renters, and they don't want to know me. They want to have a rip-roaring great time, careen around on golf carts, and park everywhere they want, even under no parking signs. Apparently, they can't read. That brings up an interesting question I'd like answered. I would like answered. Recently, I spoke to two young girls who were driving a golf cart. It stopped at her intersection. I asked the driver if she was 16 years old and had a driver's license. I told her that those were some of the requirements to be a legal driver along with insurance and state registration. She drove home, told her father, and he wasted no time in getting back to me and instructing me to mind my own business. Additionally, I have seen golf cart rental companies drop off carts to renters with no instruction as to their rights and responsibility of golf cart drivers. 
Rules and regulations of golf carts should be presented to potential, potential drivers. Without this, we have no enforcement, no respect, just excuses. Uh, I personally have driven down Palm Boulevard, uh, past a, a, a golf cart going down the street. I said, roll down the window. I said, you know what, you're not supposed to be on Palm Boulevard. His response, be a friend. <laughs> just <laughs> irritating. Um, as a concerned citizen, I'm asking you, what should we do? What, what should a concerned citizen do? And back to the short-term renters. Why should I be responsible to contact the livability police and report non-compliance? Why do I have to be the Nazi? Rental management companies do not monitor their rentals for compliance. Why isn't that part of their responsibility? Why do I have to report it? I'm asking for help. I find it difficult to accept the responsibility and lack of respect the visitors and short-term renters have. What is my role as a concerned citizen? Whether you realize it or not, you are crushing my joy for the Isle of Palms. We are on the brink of losing our love for the Isle of Palms. We've already enlisted the support of a local realtor to show us properties off the island. We are being forced to make a decision we never thought we would have to make. And these are thoughts of a 33-year-old property owner who would like to stay on the island, the old island. I thought the new city council was dedicated to upholding the rights and responsibilities of the residents. I'm not feeling the love. I'm sorry. I'm sorry in so many ways. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. Next up, Matt. Yes, my name is Dennis Schaefer. I've been living on the Isle of Palms for 28 years now. I bought my house in 1991 when I got out of the Marine Corps. I'm very concerned about tidal wave. These guys have been around for 24 years, new owners for 13 years now. I worked there 14 years ago as a boat captain. Nothing has changed with the same business all these years. So what's the problem? Uh, renewing the lease, would, uh, not renewing the lease would be wrong. These guys are great guys, they're friends and family. Um, we don't need to hurt that. It's hurting their families if we let them go from this island. Tidal waves help with the fire department, and police department, many water rescues. You know about the lady dying last year on the boat. They were the first ones there to take care of her. Um, tidal wave is also helping with the restaurants in there. People say about the parking and all that. They actually have a kid, a local kid, that monitors the parking and gets the people in and out. The restaurant's busy at one time, they're busy at the other, they help each other out. There's Uber car drivers I see all the time dropping people off. Wild Dunes drops people off with their shuttles. Um, also, we're talking about with you know all the things that Tidal Wave does. They've done the beach cleanings. They get their kids and their workers down in the marsh and clean the marshes. They help them with exchange club activities. They do free days for Isle Palms residents where you can all see how fun it is and marry many of charitable events. Um, heard there's a rumor of a beer maybe going in. One thing is, who's going to monitor it? Who's going to clean the trash up on the dock, the water? The other day I was down there and there was a fight that broke out. I took pictures. It was not the right kind of people that we needed down there that were on the dock where the uh, kayaks are. It was, I got the pictures and not good. One thing I want to tell you is usually when a company has been around so long and has done so much for a community, the city would give them an award or a medal. A huge thank you even. I'm not sure if the city's ready to do that. It kind of make me feel bad. I hope they're not getting stabbed in the back. I hope we can help them. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Yes, sir. Mr. Shirt, can I have yes. Can I have your yes. comments? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to have quite a stack tonight. <laughs> I'm Michael Finn with Tidal Wave Water Sports. And I want to let all you guys know that, you know, just as Rusty had said, I've been dealing with, the, with all these folks for the last couple months now on a basis that I've more than I want to. And I didn't, never realized how much these folks work. 
and I mean the countless hours that they put in and I want to thank you no matter what happens you do a service to this <coughs> now I'm gonna get to what I got to say <laughs> <laughs> so the marina was purchased with the spirit of giving uh, the community access to the water tidal wave was there when it was purchased tidal wave was actually there before it was purchased tidal wave was allowed to stay and was actually renewed in 2004, 2006, 2010, and 2015. So all this time, residents, if you didn't want us, why did you renew so many times? You know, what, what have we done wrong recently? Um, Tidal Wave has been here for over two decades, giving residents access to the water and being part of the fabric of the community. Now the city battles with traffic and parking issues on the island, just like all islands, and it's mainly on the weekends of the summer. If Tidal Wave had those issues, it would be during the week when we are the busiest. You know, we just survive the weekends just like y'all. Um, Charleston has grown at a staggering rate in recent years and will probably continue to grow. While I know that's not what you want to hear, we as a community cannot ignore it. It keeps knocking on our proverbial door. Removing a business to make the island less attractive is not the answer. The answer lies in a much different solution, and that is control of traffic by means of public transit. Now, I know there's been talk about that, but you know, a year ago, we had came forward with a shuttle service called IOP Adventures. It was a 15 passenger van, and we were gonna expand on it. Um, it was received well by the council, but there were some logistics. We would like to continue to work on ideas like that with the city to make the tourist season less impactful on all of the residents. Uh, there's been much talk, ideas, and rumors surrounding the thoughts on the future of our business. So this time I'm going to give my best sales, sales pitch. We understand the residents' desire for public access to the water, but why does it come at the expense of removing tidal wave? Could there be another solution? We would like to thank the city for giving us the option to use the Morgan Creek docks while the city's and Tidal Wave's joint permit of our existing docks come into compliance. Change is scary, especially when it could potentially change your ability to make a living. While we would still like to have our dock and believe that that's the best option, we are willing to work with the city in finding a solution that works for both of us. So as long as we can operate at the same capacity and we keep the same parking for there. The restaurant docks have much potential as either resident docks or future water sports docks. While the restaurant has leased uh, the docks, they have been drastically underused. The restaurant is not a water dependent business. It will thrive whether or not the lease of the restaurant has the docks or not. But having Tidal Wave and other activities next to the restaurant will bring far more customers to that restaurant than, my, than giving my dock or the extra docks or a couple extra parking spots. You know, we all feed off of each other and making a decision to remove us to help get a better restaurant in is not definitely not the answer. I'm gonna go back to the referendum. It was soundly defeated, but what did that mean? To basically, to many, basically, the community didn't want to pay for marina upgrades and they wanted better access to the marina. The referendum was also defeated because it was presented to the residents that the island is in dire straits financially and the marina is a constant, constant drain with no return on investment. Our new lease proposal that you guys got two weeks ago uh, will bring added revenue to the city and keep a highly desired business that will help fund a tax money brought in, further helping the city deal with marina funding. And we had anticipated this non-renewal. To be proactive, like I said, we went there and uh, we uh, gave you guys lease terms. Now, the, the lease terms are basically everything that we thought you guys wanted. It's more money. It's double what we're paying now. It's based off of total sales, not gross profit. I've been wanting that for years. Uh, you know, just like everybody, like you said, people can do things and no matter what, how you present your books, people are always gonna wonder because gross, gross profit is not the way to do it. It should be off of total sales. Also, our, uh, our lease, we want a triple net lease. We want to take care of ours. We don't want to burden the city with anything. The only thing we'd have, have, to have you guys do is help with the permits for removing the pylons. Other than that, we'll take care of everything. Um, also, with our, with our lease, it could yield a quarter of a million dollars. 
to the city during our next lease term. You take, us, take that away, there's nothing. The city is still grasping at straws. Um, these funds could, uh, sorry, these funds could be used for the marine improvements, but these funds could also be used for the transportation that I was talking about, doing citywide transportation. Um, <coughs> bidding our dock has been a suggestion. The suggestion uh, for the sake of consistency, because you guys are bidding the restaurant dock. Councilmember Bell, you once complimented me by saying, in the past by saying, you believe we were the only water sports company that should be there. And you graciously said that no one could do a better job than us. The question was, was there going to be a water sports company there or not? And I hope you still feel that way. Our business is unique for all of you guys who don't know. There are only 103 of us nationwide. 12 states actually don't have any. So how can having a unique business like this, being a part of the community, be a bad thing? Like kind of getting back to my point, unlike a restaurant or other common business, not everybody can do what we do. So we feel sending it out for a bid would just be a waste of time, money, and resources. Uh, we are good for the community. We have been part of the fabric of the community for two decades, employing dozens of young Isle of Palms residents, providing such services for the community. Recently, we had our Isle of Palms Residence Day. Some of you might know what it is, and some of you might not. It's a day that is dedicated. We shut down, and we offer all of our activities for free to all residents. Okay, and it also benefits a charity. Last fall, our residence day raised six thousand dollars for Sean Jenkins Children's Hospital. The one we did two weeks ago benefited the Isle of Palms Exchange Club in their pursuit to uh, get a dock for veterans and at-risk at youth. We are good for local businesses. We get time on boats with these people. It's not like a turnstile. We, you know, we don't want to be Myrtle Beach. Okay. We like to have time with people. We promote local businesses. People want to know the inside scoop. They want to know where the real good place to eat is. They don't want to know just what's on an advertisement. So being able to promote other things on the island is very good for businesses. There was also, people had suggested us getting smaller. This, to me, borderlines on cruel. You know, any small business owner, Mr. Buchanan, anybody, who owns a business, why would you ever cut your business in half or be asked to let, make less money. You know, it's just, to me, it's just good. I can't even imagine this. And the suggestion is without data supporting this idea. We operate within our lease. We are not using extra equipment as some would suggest. We are just running efficiently like any good business owner would. We have operated safely at this capacity for years and have never had a problem with parking. Who asked, uh, I say, who asked a company to do less business? You would never ask the Harris Teeter to do less business. In, in summary, we would like to continue providing a very sought after product to visitors in the community. On the agenda tonight is to vote, you guys are going to vote on not renewing the Tidal Waves lease as it is written. This leaves so much for interpretation. After that goes, where do we stand? Are we going to be a part of the community? Are we not? You know, so I, to me, it's, it's the same thing as not renewing us at all. And I feel, and we're hoping that the council would at least accept our new lease proposal as a basis of moving forward and committing to Tidal Wave being here. It may not be, it's not set in stone, but we need to know. I mean, we just need to know. Lastly, on a human level, you know, my you know, some don't know, uh, Michael Malley is also, uh, raise your hand now, is also our business partner. He's been a friend of ours since college, and this was our dream. Closing us down, you know, we all moved here from other places. Closing us down, we can't go anywhere else. This is the only place we can do this. You know, we don't want to move anywhere else. I don't want to move to Myrtle Beach. You know, I love the Isle of Palms. I love the community around here. You know, my dad got his captain's license so he could come and join us. You know, he's at our, at our dock every day. And the ability to see him in his later years and just have fun is something that's irreplaceable and uh, truly priceless. Thank you for giving me the time to speak. Michael. Michael, Michael. Give me your words. You didn't give them to me last week. You didn't give them to me. You gotta give them to me. I don't read the notes. My name is Dave Guilford. Uh, my wife and I live at 1842nd Avenue. 
Uh, we've owned that property since 2003. Uh, like most of you, we've seen a lot of change here on the island. Uh, first of all, I guess I should thank the city council for what you're doing. I serve a number of volunteer boards and civic boards and uses not a lot of love there. So I'm not up here to criticize you. I'm not up here to be a character witness for anybody else, but I am up here to say if I understand your job properly, it is to make sure that you ensure the quality of life and safety of the residents and property owners, first and foremost, who voted for you, and secondly, for the visitors that come to the island. Uh, I think it's pretty clear with all of the additional development we've had over the last several eight years since we got out of the Great Recession that uh, we have just about reached a breaking point. So I think the question is for any business, uh, whether it's a small operating business or a real estate business, can the island afford more of that? Does the island need that? Uh, you know, we, we're like uh, an island with 24 lanes of traffic coming our way every day <coughs> this summer, and probably only six or eight lanes the rest of the year. Uh, so I, I think it's time that the, uh, the city council started managing it hopefully in a proactive way thinking about the growth that will continue to come and what do you do to manage that growth uh, and it may be at the expense of a small business I've started four of those two of them didn't make it two of them did so you know I've got experience with that too but but the business has got to be compatible with its uh, its customers and its environment so I could go on, but I think that, that's pretty much the, the highlight. Just think about who you're responsible to. Think about the bigger picture of growth and activity and traffic. And think about the safety and comfort for your residents and your visitors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. You Trump Gary every time. <laughs> That's what CEOs do. <laughs> My name is Julie Nessler. I live at, on 22nd Avenue, number 17. And I am here on behalf of my husband Gary and I's daughter, who's 16 years old. Her name is Aspen. So I came home from school today, and she had a letter that she wanted me to present tonight. So I'm going to read it. And it's on behalf of Tidal Wave. Good evening. On behalf of my daughter, Aspen Nessler, she has respectfully asked me to read this letter to all city council members, to whom it may concern. Tidal Wave Sports has been such a staple to the city of the Isle of Palms. The business has provided such pleasure to my friends, family, and acquaintances. Tidal Wave Sports has helped bring part of the city of Isle of Palms to life each and every day. The politeness, the courtesy of the staff portrays what I'm sorry, the courtesy that the staff portrays is beyond me. Every time I go to the business, the respect is given to anyone who walks onto the dock. All due respect to all council members, this business has brought nothing but joy to the citizens of Isle of Palms, as well as continuously helping the city, Isle of Palms Fire Department save lives and keep families safe. They do so by fall allowing access to their dock when the marina's boat launch is crowded. With that hazard, this business has shown extreme health and dedication to the community. With all being said the continu and continued respect, please continue to ask yourself and keep in mind your family. How can we continue to be a safe city or even a healthy city without the health, the happiness of Tidal Way Sports? Please ask yourself, why take away the happiness and the fun that is sadly not shown around the world today? My experience with this particular business has been nothing but a pleasure for the many years I have been a resident of the Isle of Palms. Please, I hope you keep in mind the importance that this business brings upon the city. Thank you. That is from Aspen. Now for me. <laughs> Safety is such a concern. And I can tell you with Gary being on the fire department as a volunteer, there have been countless times that the fire boat has not been able to get into the water because the marina is packed. And Tidal Wave Sports 
has dropped everything to get either Gary or other fire members, firefighters, to a scene of an accident. The woman, to the point of the woman who lost her life last summer, they were the first ones to get Gary on the back of the jet ski because there was no access to the water because the fire boat, the launch ramp was full and they dropped everything. So, insofar as our community, everybody's gonna have a difference of opinion. You might think it's gonna turn out to be a Myrtle Beach, it's not. These boys are not running their business that way. And they are such an asset to the community, not only on the safety side, but how they run their business and how they make every person feel. And they, they go out of their way. To the point of the um, residence day, they give up their income that day, and those funds that people donate go to a certain organization. The last one, it was to uh, the Exchange Club for help of veterans and all the other supports, all the other um, entities that the Exchange Club supports. Um, the Children's Hospital, they raised money for the Children's Hospital who in fact helped a resident on this island live by her being in that Children's Hospital. So I cannot say enough about the importance of having this business on this island simply from a safety standpoint. That is all. Thank you. Thank you. Stand here close. Come on in. Go ahead. Gary, you're next. <laughs> Short one tonight. <laughs> um, Alexander Stone, Seminence in Court this year. Um, Residents in 73, property owners in 78. Um, boy, have I seen changes. I wish I had built a gate when I got here. <laughs> you laugh. Um, two things on my uh, radar that uh, are concerning to me. One is a uh, tax increase on the residents of 3% towards the uh, uh, sewer and water. And um, if I'm not mistaken, that 3% is going to go towards uh, properties that are on septic tanks and have to install or hook into the sewer. Uh, I don't believe I'm already on the sewer. I'm paying, I've paid. Uh, I don't want to subsidize those that have not paid at the same increment I have. I think that there should be a tie-in tap fee for the water and the sewer rather than all of us paying for people that currently don't have sewer, if that is what that fee is intended for. The other one, of course, is near and dear to my heart. I am a vacation rental manager and um, have a very small business in the community that generates a lot of income uh, along with several other people in the community that do the same thing. Uh, currently, you have and know of through the building department and the building license fees uh, that are being charged at some uh, rate, I don't know the number, but you're soon to double it. Uh, that's 100% increase. Uh, I wish that you all would take that back and reconsider that egregious increase and come back with something a little more reasonable. The unintended consequences of this action, if you do go forward with the second and ultimately the third reading, will be that you will create a financial incentive for people to go underground. We already have vacation rental businesses in the community now that are underground because of fees, whether it's the accommodations, the sales tax, whatever the fee is, uh, they're doing it off the books. And now I'm not talking about some little house on Cameron that does everything under the, the radar. It's the ones that perhaps I manage and they tell me block it off for maintenance. But it's really Uncle Bob coming at some discounted rate. 
that's off the books. And you're going to create more incentive for more of that to take place because they're not going to report that income so that it's taxed at the egregious limits and that way that you're <laughs> suggesting. That's uh, basically all I say. Oh, and thanks for your service. <laughs> <Been there, done that. laughs> Uh, Gary. You're next. I'm next. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> All right, please. Um, uh, Dr. Gary Nestler, I live with my wife and daughter, 1722nd Avenue. My house, our house is always open. Um, let me tell you that there are several things that you've heard this evening, so I'm not, I will do my best not to repeat them. But my first experience here on the Isle of Palms actually was running into these two gentlemen who own Tyler Sports. Since then, life has um, developed into something even more grand. Uh, a wonderful relationship with all on city council, uh, supporting them. I have been, Roger can answer this, uh, battalion chief. Uh, more than a decade I've been a volunteer fighter here, um, mostly working water rescue and medical calls and uh, was promoted to a captain. And I have first-hand knowledge of how a commercial enterprise <coughs> stops everything in order to make sure that fire service personnel, police personnel can get on the water and help people. Not only that, when we're on the water because we own watercraft, it's comforting to see these guys out because I have seen them jump into the water and help people with their boats, tow people back. Um, my, wife, my wife made reference to an unfortunate circumstance that happened last year with a young lady who lost her life in um, an unfortunate accident, had two children on board, plus a husband, um, and uh, there were probably no fewer than six or seven public safety boats that were out there um, helping to rescue this, uh, this young lady. Unfortunately, um, it was a uh, tragedy. She died on scene. Uh, that being the case, what it uh, <coughs> transpired is that um, Charleston County Rescue and Sheriff's Office and DNR and our fire boat, everybody left the scene to leave the husband and the grieving children where the woman lost her life, except for one other person, which was Tyler. And they worked tirelessly to bring their boat back, not having any words, not saying anything to anybody, it was just a duty that they thought that it was theirs. So I have also spoke to many people. People have called me out of the blue and said, please support Tidal Wave uh, as an enterprise, as a commercial enterprise. And it's not because they offer public safety. They're good, they're good guys. They run a successful business. Um, they give back to the community, as um, Michael was saying. Um, they, uh, they are a fabric of the community. Um, I am very confident in the City Council, that I can tell you, uh, because I think that they have enough experience to know shutting down an enterprise like that will have a tremendous pullback from the citizens as number one. Number two is there is a way to work out everything. Everything's negotiable. There are some unused portions of the, uh, of the, of the uh, marina, of the, of the boat docks, um, and I think that they've been working um, to try and come to some sort of resolution. I encourage both Council and Tidal Wave to continue to work together to really share what the Isle of Palms really means to the citizens and to those who seek out Isle of Palms as a destination. <coughs> I apologize um, to those who feel that uh, the city, our city, um, has become overdeveloped in bringing more people in for the traffic. There's nothing that we can do about that except embrace the change because that's what's constant, and make sure that we allow people to come in, provide them safe, a safe environment, especially with recreational sports. And some have never had, had, had been on a, a jet ski, uh, watching these people take, watching uh, Tidal Wave take extraordinary efforts to train them, to talk to them, to show them the waterway, to show them what would happen in the event that something should happen, really exercise some good safety hygiene. Um, my final comment is the fact that um, shutting them down, I don't think anybody is really wanting to do. So for those who say we're going to shut them down, I think that's passed. Having talked to council, having sat in uh, many meetings with certain council members, I think that everybody's moving 
towards some sort of resolution. So if it comes up for um, a vote, or whatever the case may be, I would encourage both sides to come together and work together from each side of the aisle. That's what's important. And to my daughter, 16 years old, she has always viewed the marina as a safe place to go. Always. Tidal Wave has been that one spot, that one spot that she goes to. And if she just wants to sit and watch on the water, she goes there and she sits and she watches on the water. So I just, again, continue to encourage you to work together, put your personal opinions aside. This is a destination island. This is a residence island. And you should embrace it as such. Thank you very much for your service. Public safety personnel always thank you for your service. And Tidal Wave, words cannot express how grateful we are from a public safety standpoint of what you do for the island and for the citizens and the visitors. So thank you. Thank you. a long-time business who has served our community very well. In addition to that, they provide a wanted service not only to our tourists, but as well for our citizens of the Isle of Fox. Tidal Wave is the only spot on the island where you can rent a jet ski, go parasailing, and do wakeboarding. And I know not all of you have mentioned this before, but <coughs> some of us have a lot of fun doing this. <laughs> I went jet skiing there the other day myself, and it was an amazing experience. I don't need to go into detail um, of what we citizens enjoy about Tidal Wave, but I would like to point out um, that if their lease is not extended, these fun water sports will no longer be avail available for our citizens. I myself and my neighbors enjoy their services, and so do my friends and my family that visits. One of the ma main reasons people come to this island is to enjoy water activities, and Tidal Wave does a great job providing fun water sports for everyone. Besides that, they also hire local students, which we very much appreciate. They support local charities, for example, um, the Alphonse Exchange Club, and I'm also a member of that. So thank you guys. Um, and from, from what I've been reading on our local Isle Palms Facebook page, um, <laughs> they're the first ones that drop everything when emergencies happen on the water. So that is really great to you guys. Um, therefore, please don't vote against but for the renewal of uh, the tidal wave, please. We citizens of the Isle of Palms get a lot of fun and recreation of tidal wave water sports. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, sir. Hello. My name is Van Knapp. Uh, my wife and I live at 2941 Avenue. Um, everybody's kind of gone over the facts and what they've done. There's no doubt that they, they do a great job at Tidal Wave. Um, but I want to give you a little bit of of our first-hand experience. I guess our first experience with them was when our daughters went to work for them. Uh, both of them worked for them for several years. Uh, it was a great experience for them. Um, they had a job, that was good. <laughs> and they weren't, you know, running a cash register somewhere. Or they enjoyed it. Uh, they got a lot out of it. Um, since that time, we've remained friends with Mark, Michael, and Mally, um, and, it, and it's been great. We can go down there and visit anytime. They're always hospitable. Uh, we live on 41st. I think if you did away with them, the traffic's not going to be any different on 41st. Uh, it's not going to be any better. Your traffic's not going to go away. Um, I keep hearing that the, the public doesn't have access to the marina, to the water. I don't know how they're going to change that. Uh, if you've got their dock <coughs> vacant, you know, you're not going to fish down there. You can't catch any fish there. Uh, so I really don't see any benefit in, in not working with them to work out the lease. 
to uh, to have them remain there as a part of the community. Um, you know, we live right there. I go to the Marina all the time. I'm going to go down there and just drive around and see what's going on. Um, I go down there to eat. I go down there to, to parasail. Uh, I remember the first time we went out, took my wife, she didn't know we were doing that. <laughs> she, she cried the whole way out there. <laughs> we didn't go first, there were a couple of us on the road there at first, and she told me before she went, she, cannot, she said, I can tell you now, we're coming back to do this. Uh, and had a great time. We've taken our daughters out, we've taken their friends out. Um, it's a good thing to have in the avenue. I just want to offer my support. Okay. Thank you. Yes, yes, ma'am. I want to get to everybody, and this is what small town politics is about. <laughs> Listen to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Carla Kanet. I'm Van's wife. <laughs> Live at 2941st Avenue. I'm a native of Mount Pleasant, born and raised here, worked at Wild Dunes while I was in college, and I've lived on 41st Avenue for over 21 years. My husband and I raised our family there, he mentioned that. As a tax-paying citizen, it is extremely concerning to me that the town is considering essentially putting Tidal Wave Water Sports out of business by not renewing their lease. Tidal Wave is a respectable, reputable, successful business that has provided income for the town through their lease and their taxes for many years. Tidal Wave is an integral part of our com community. They've hired many island kids, giving some of them their first real job, and they've taught them the values and responsibilities of having a job. Both of our daughters worked for them for several summers. We also had two additional college girls living with us one summer who Tidal Wave also employed. They learned customer service, scheduling multiple activities, cash management, water safety, and much about the ecosystems of our unique and treasured environment. They provided rescue support to the fire department over the years and have been first responders to several tragic accidents. They're a helpful presence on the waterways providing assistance to many recreational boaters in the area. They've helped kayakers, they've just numerous. You see them out there, somebody needs help, they go. And they get back to the community, which we, has been mentioned before with their um, free residence days. They also, for years, took a parasail boat and staff members to Camp Happy Days for a week, free of charge, to provide the experience for some of those kids there going through tough times undergoing treatment for cancer. <coughs> They're a valuable business to residents and tourists alike. They provide access to the water for many who do not have a boat <coughs> or a jet ski to be able, and they enable them to enjoy the waterways that surround us. They have and they monitor their own parking area and they do not contribute to parking congestion at the marina. They also advertise on their website now that they offer a 10% discount to anyone who arrives um, by Uber or Lyft. The marina has been at the end of 41st Avenue for as long as I can remember. And that's a long time. <laughs> we knew that when we chose to buy our house and live on this street. It has been suggested that they cause more traffic on 41st. Having lived on 41st for 21 years and having boated all my life, I can tell you there is no more traffic on 41st than any road leading to any other marina. That's just how it is. Um, however, at their own initiative, Tidal Wave has purchased a 15-passenger van to shuttle guests from other parts of the island. They are doing their best to work with us to stay in business and provide the, the benefits that they do for us. Michael Fim, Mark Fim, and Michael Malley are good, kind, giving people who own and operate a successful business that provides fun, safe access to the waterways surrounding us. Those of us who are fortunate enough to live here should support and value those who operate businesses here for the good of the people, residents and tourists alike. 
To put Tidal Wave out of business to satisfy a small minority of Isle of Palms residents would be devastating to Michael, Mark, and Michael and their families. It would be unkind, fiscally irresponsible, and shameful. I implore Council to consider all of these points and exercise the option to renew Tidal Wave's lease. As elected officials, please act in the best interest of the majority of the island residents and do the right thing. And thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Jason Hilton. I'm terrible at public speaking. I've worked at the marina for 13 summers now. I think Carla stole my notes because that was basically everything I want to say. Touch on the, uh, you know, the the first responders. Um, I guess my side running the parking lot. Um, they're the only business out there that actually has a guy that that gives me a hand um, with the boat ramp, the people coming in. It's just madness. It's a losing battle every week. Um, basically, uh, I want to conclude with like, I've uh, known them for 13 years, glad to call them my friends, and uh, I think Isle of Palms would be a lesser place without them. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm Ginger Campbell. I live on Isle of Palms. I've lived here five years and been visiting my boyfriend for 20. Um, I also work at Tidal Wave. It's not my job, it's my career. I love that place. Like, I found him. Oh, I live at 3907 Hartnett Boulevard, right near Randy. Um, so, like I said, it's my career. I'm planning on retiring there. I'm going to have my walker with tennis balls going down the dock. So, don't get rid of us. I need this job. Um, <laughs> But I want to talk about the kids. I mean, everybody's talked a lot about what's going on. But I have a list here from the five years that I've, I'm on my sixth season. The five years I've worked for Tidal Wave, here is 26 people that live on this island that have worked for Tidal Wave. They have all come back to us. They're our friends. They're our kids. They're our family. My kids love me so much. I've got a young man right here that's supposed to be studying for the exams at the Citadel right now, but he's here to support us. I got my other two kids over there that call me Auntie Ginger. Wave, guys, because they love us. The kids love us. We give them a start. We teach them so much, and you guys talked about that. Um, I don't know if y'all have ever read our reviews at Tidal Wave. I have a list. TripAdvisors, 548 excellent reviews. Nobody gives excellent reviews. That's a hard thing to do. I could go through and read them all. I wrote a few down. Best time ever. Best thing in Charleston, fabulous experience, lots of explanation points, best day ever, what a blast. I could keep going. So I just want y'all to think about Tide Away. We are here for the island. Like, we have residents that come constantly. They love us. We give discounts to residents. We take care of residents. We clean. Susan and I are trying to find a way to clean the marsh, like set up a real program like the beach cleanup that we do once a week. We want to do a marsh cleanup. We're here for you guys. That's all we want to do. Be here for the island. We don't make traffic worse. We make the island better. Thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir. Ma'am, I'm sorry. I believe I'm not going to talk about coyotes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I would say anything here today. My name's Jillian Kerber, and I live at 11 Hidden Green. But I just wanted to sort of chirp up and piggyback what some of these folks have been saying about Tidal Wave. We moved here three years ago, and as you can imagine, we have a lot of house guests. And uh, there is nothing that we enjoy more than riding our bikes over to the marina with everyone in tow. We've probably spent over $1,000 a summer um, at Tidal Wave gladly because it makes for a whole afternoon when you have that sort of burden of entertaining people. We have a great time on jet skis. We've done the boat had great guys take us out and then we have lunch at the marina and it's a whole afternoon and conversely one summer uh, last summer we had taken some kids so many times there that we decided to try 
uh, individual power boats over on the other side of the peninsula just on James Island little I think it's Charleston speed boats and it was horrible <laughs> I mean no disrespect meant to them but it was no comparison it was not as professionally run the idea of having to leave the island to go entertain ourselves and our company is just a sad thing so I would beg you all to consider working this out and then the last thing is I had out-of-town guests the day that the woman had the tragic accident at the marina. We were coming in on our jet skis and we saw firsthand how these guys, the first responders came running in, they jumped on those jet skis and we watched one of you two, I can't tell the two of you all apart, <laughs> bring in that, tow in that family. And it is something that will, cause we were eating lunch at the marina and it was just something that we'll never forget. These are quality people. It's an asset to the residents of this island. So that's, that's my two cents. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Connor. Um, I worked at Tidal Wave for like almost three summers now. Um, I've lived on uh, Fifth Avenue, 31st Avenue. Um, my parents just bought a place. They have land in um, uh, Morgan's Cove and Wild Dunes. I'm on three Sandpiper Lane right now, so I've lived in a bunch of places on the island. And I can tell you that for the first three spots we lived on the island, um, I didn't even know what Tidal Wave Water Sports was. Um, so to me, I don't believe that that would ever be the reason that why the island's getting more busy. Um, I also work for the Lynx Course in Wild Dunes and Wild Dune just got bought out by Hyatt. They're building a huge hotel in there. Um, so I don't think at all that the marina is the reason ever that the island would get more busy. Um, I mean, that resort's gonna be huge in Wild Dunes. I mean, the golf courses bring so many people in in Wild Dunes. Um, and I think that it's just foolish to think that you would want to reverse something, an opportunity that you have, and try to make it, you should be trying to make it better and benefit everyone that's already here, as well as the people that are coming in and that already live here, um, and influence them to see how good this island is, and not try to reverse it, and be back to the old ways of where you could just take your boat out whenever you wanted. I mean, you can still do that. There's plenty of places to launch a boat, in all of Mount Pleasant, they have plenty of public docks in Mount Pleasant still, and um, on Isle, uh, Isle of Palms also. And uh, I just want to say that as far as a job, I've had nobody that's taught me more than these three have ever. Uh, they've made me love motors and love motorsports more than I ever had. They're the only ones that ever told me and really influenced me to be creative and love what I do as a job and not treat it as a job but treat it as something that I love as a career um, and I just think it's a huge benefit to the com community. The first time I ever rode a jet ski was in Outer Banks in North Carolina and it doesn't compare at all to what Tidal Wave is. Um, I think you'd see a huge difference if you ever went to another jet ski rental place or something. And um, I don't know. I think if you ever had someone else different here that had that could run the dock, it would never be the same as the way they run it. Um, and that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else? Yes, sir. Please. You're not studying right now. <laughs> Probably should be. <laughs> uh, my name is Jeremy Samuels. I'm a senior cadet at the Citadel. I've worked at Tidal Wave for the past three years. One thing at the Citadel they teach you in our three core values is honor, duty, and respect. And I realize you can learn that at a lot more places in the Citadel, especially at Tidal Wave Water Sports. My first day of work this summer, my boss asked me if I wanted to work, and I'm a college student who's broke, so of course I said yes. I've been there three years, but the one thing he had me do that whole day was pick up trash around the whole marina. Not just Tidal Wave side, everywhere we went. I had a couple trash bags full. I didn't used to be this big until I started lifting all the trash <laughs> he had me picking up. 
Ginger, uh, the lady who spoke before, she always makes sure if there's a water bottle floating in, she'll have you dive right after and get it, for, no matter what. She doesn't let anybody litter, and she always makes sure we go and get it. In fact, as part of the Citadel, you have to do community service, and she was one of the people who inspired me to do that around your city, despite the fact that I don't live in it. Uh, this Tidal Wave Water Sports has uh, employed seven Citadel football players. Same guys who tied Alabama at half and kind of brought a little fame to them, right? Uh, it was that extra cardio. Obviously, I haven't been doing it, but as you see, um, six of those players are business majors. These guys, my bosses, could have just let us work, just toil away, but they've sat us down, went over the books, told us how they made their business so effective. They taught us why caring about this community has been so important to their success. One of them's uh, engineer. One of my bosses, Mark, is an engineer. He sat down with him and explained all the components of the engine. And I don't know if it correlates or not, but that uh, employee's grades have went up since then. Uh, in terms of just having an impact on this community, it goes a lot farther than that. It has an impact for the Citadel. It has an impact for me. And um, I just think it'd be a shame just to uh, do away with someone that's had uh, a business that's had so much influence on my life. I could have got a higher paying job, but I wouldn't want to work for anybody else. Um, I saw my boss, who has a bad back, terrible back. Uh, he towed a family in after a <sighs> horrific accident. He literally put it on his back. And that's just something you can't find in a lot of people these days. And that's why, as a Citadel cadet, I know that they're full of honor, duty, and respect. And I think they also bring those values to this community. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Good job. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Olivia Bueno. I am not talking about tidal waves today. I'm actually talking about another um, issue or something that you guys are considering. So my name is Olivia. I am the vice chair of the Charleston Surfrider Foundation, a local grassroots nonprofit that protects our waterways. So thank you, Tidal Wave, for doing what you do. It's actually really great to hear. I'm in the environmental field that a marina or you know a water sports company you know is doing something like that so I, th I appreciate that thank you first I want to applaud you all for leading our state into the right path of reducing single-use plastic waste since your ban in 2015 we now have 17 municipalities that have banned single-use plastics um, however we still do face challenges with large amounts of single-use plastics created used and still ending up in our waterways and now entering our drinking water and food chain I'm sure you all are familiar with your famous Owl Palms Beach Santa who has been collecting and recording the amount of trash he finds on Owl Palms for over a year. Just yesterday though, he did pick up over a thousand pieces of trash with the most common found items being cigarettes and single use plastics. So this does show that we still do have an issue even with the point of sale ordinances in place. So I'm here today to show support of prohibiting the use of plastic and other foam products on the beach. My organization was personally involved with the beach prohibition ordinance of plastic, styrofoam and balloons on Folly Beach three years ago and it has been very successful thanks to our education efforts surrounding the ordinance versus increasing increasing enforcement. We worked with the city staff on installing new signages as well as doing bi-weekly cleanups during the high season to educate the public about this new change. Since then, we've seen an 80% reduction of plastic bags found on, the, on Follies Beach since they passed this plastic ordinance and beach prohibition. We, the local environmental organizations, are willing to provide our time and resources to make this beach prohibition successful like Follies. Thank you again for considering this prohibition. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Uh, well, Jimmy, uh, one more. Perhaps notes? I'll be the last. Do you want her notes? Oh. 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 Name and address, please. Thank you. <laughs> Ted Kinghorn, <coughs> Passaic, New Jersey. No, I'm Ted Kinghorn, 412 Merritt Boulevard. I wanted to. Uh, change the mood a bit and recognize the recent passing of Senator Hollings. Uh, for those of you that didn't know Senator Hollings, you've read about him, no doubt, the last two weeks, and you're aware of his military record, his service to the state, and service to the federal government by being in the U.S. Senate. Uh, he had a life well lived, uh, had a great sense of humor, 
in South Carolina parlance, he was a real hoot. And any time you got to spend around him was going to be enjoyable, productive, and exceptional. Um, he was an outstanding public servant. I had the opportunity to work with him when I was employed in the Senate for four years and then worked with him and his staff uh, the rest of his career on matters related to local government and state government in South Carolina. One of the reasons why I chose to run for City Council are meetings just like this evening. The issues aren't always easy. There's diverse opinions. There are emotional opinions. But just the information and the sense that we got here this evening about our community is really heartwarming. And in thinking about public service, I wanted to compliment all of my colleagues on council. Um, we don't always disagree. We come from different backgrounds, different professional experiences, different personal experiences. But what everyone here has is the island's best interest in heart. I know that. I know we won't always get to the same place, and that will probably take place in about a minute, <laughs> and many issues, but that's okay. And I want all of you to know that I respect your service, I respect the people that have come before us in government, and I respect those that will serve in the future, and I hope all of our citizens will continue to stay engaged. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, I think we've done a pretty good job of letting everybody speak tonight, and I think we need to go forward now with our regularly scheduled program. Oh, please, Your Honor, I, I was waiting to see if there were any other citizens of the island to speak, but I do have some You comments. please come forward. Please. <laughs> My name is <laughs> Thank you. A dear friend from many years ago. That's right. Um, I don't live on the Isle of Palmas. My name is Graham Sturgis. I live at 1131 Wando Road in Canehoy. Isle of Palmas has been very central in my life though I began coming down here when I was about 10 with my family. My first surfing experience was at age 15 next to the pier. I had no clue what I was doing but I found out that I loved it. When I got out of law school the first place I moved to was the Isle of Palms and I lived here for six years. I met my wife on Palm Boulevard. I proposed to her on Ocean Boulevard. And our first home was back on Palm Boulevard. When my son Tripp got old enough to learn to surf, I spent a lot of days, as did my wife, traveling between Canehoy and the Isle of Palms. The Isle of uh, Palms has been central in our life, and I want other people to enjoy the experience that it was for me, and it still is for my son. I'm aware that honorable council members and honorable mayor have been considering the impact of maybe having surf lessons available on the island. I was talking to the mayor. Uh, I know Mr. Bell here has, is, I hate to say has been a surfer, is a surfer. Um, it's tough to figure out what you're doing, and we didn't have any help. We did it the hard way by finding out how not to do it. I'm proud to say that uh, we want to offer an opportunity for people to come to the Isle of Palms to learn how to do something that's unique to what you have here. You can play tennis, you can play golf, you can go fishing anywhere. You want to surf, you need an ocean. And there are right ways to do things, there are wrong ways to do things. My son Tripp, who would be one of the people who would be applying for a proposal to you, and Ed Honeycutt's son, Matt, is another. He's the only ASI, which is a globally recognized organization, surfing instructor, I think, between Florida and North Carolina. Went to Hawaii, uh, passed their water safety, water rescue, surfing instruction. Has gotten Red Cross certified in life saving, CPR, water rescue, all of these things. I understand your concern is that, well, if we start allowing a commercial activity on the beach, the Pandora's box opens up, and how do we stop it? I'm here to tell you that that's a concern that can be met because it's being met by other cities. Santa Cruz, California, one of the top surf destinations in the United States is dealing with it. San Diego, Southampton up off of Long Island. 
What they have each done is to pass an ordinance. And the ordinance says that these surf schools are being set up to protect legitimate interest of the state and of the city, specifically the one, the preamble of the surf school regulations and ordinance from Santa Cruz says, the purpose of this chapter is to regulate commercial use, <coughs> reduce conflicts among users, and protect public safety, health, welfare, and the enjoyment, there it's Cowell, Recre Cowell Beach Recreation Area, and the adjacent neighborhood areas. When people rent a surfboard, which you, I don't know if you can do it on the island, but you can certainly do it in Mount Pleasant, and they come out here, they don't know water safety, they can't read a wave, there's nobody with experience in the water with them. We had to learn surfing etiquette. That means the person who gets on the wave closest to the curl has the right of way. We had to learn to watch out for swimmers and to pick areas where it would be safe. We got an opportunity here to be the only place east of the Kerpa to teach water safety in a responsible way where kids who live on the Isle of Palms and are now going to Folly Beach to do this can do it right here. Kids from Mount Pleasant can do it right here and there will be safer surfers. You're going to have surfers. They'll be safer. They're going to be good stewards of the beach. We just heard from Surf Rider Foundation. I'm a member. My son's a member. My wife is a member. We got the stickers on our cars. I commend you for your awareness of ocean ecology. There's no sportsman's group anywhere that's more dedicated to protecting the ocean and the beach than surfers. When we get through surfing, we don't leave diapers and bottles and cans on the beach. We pick them up from other people and we carry them out. We have a saying that's take nothing in, leave no footprints. And that you can do that because the tide comes in and make sure that that doesn't happen. I want you to give serious consideration to this opportunity. You won't be opening <laughs> up the door to having hot dog wagons going up and down the beach and raft rentals. You're going to have surfers. Let's use this opportunity to do it right. Like I said, you can play tennis, golf, anywhere. You want to surf? I started here. I think Mayor Carroll started here. It's a special place you've got. Let's learn how to protect it and do it right. What we're proposing, I've given a copy of this to Madam Clerk so that each of you will have a copy. The Santa Cruz ordinance says you have four people in the water with each instructor. You can limit the total number of people. We're proposing just having two instructors. That's six people. That's a drop <coughs> of water or a grain of sand in terms of the crowds we're talking about. It's not no, uh, low impact, it's no impact, except in a positive way. So please give this some consideration. That's all we're asking is that you look at this and see that other progressive cities like the Isle of Palms, as big as Santa Cruz and San Diego, have found a way to make it work. I believe you can do it too. Thank you so much for letting me come. Thank you. Okay. I almost think Donnie getting up to speak, so. <laughs> uh, Desiree, I think you've got something to propose as for the HGTV series. Yes. Since they cannot be here in person. Yes, let's see if I get a bond in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> um, the production company, Circus Drug Productions, have been um, producing the show HGTV House Hunters for about 20 years, and they're requesting city-sponsored event status approval from city council um, to film on the beach within Wild Dunes on Thursday, May 2nd. This is going to be a documentary-style television series highlighting the client's, the client's emotional experience while uh, finding and purchasing a house. <laughs> Their request is to videotape the home buyer, her small dog, and her friend, who's also her agent, while walking on the beach and um, this footage will be included in an upcoming episode and will provide a visual for viewers of what coastal living is in South Carolina. 
the estimated arrival time to the beach would be 10 a.m. and they would be leaving at 12.30, so only a two hour, two and a half hour um, time. Their crew includes four people, a camera person, an audio engineer, production assistant, and a field producer. It will be done with a single professional handheld video camera, so no generators, no um, cables running through public areas. And their goal is not to expect, not to cause any disruption to the city. And they've already submitted the certificate of insuring, naming the city as an additional insured. Um, we recommend that city council grant city sponsored event status. This is a low impact, quick production that should highlight the city in a good light. So moved. Second. <laughs> a discussion. No. <laughs> All those in favor, say on. Aye. Aye. Nays? Unanimous. All right, now for a good presentation Thomas and Hutton, Mark Yotis. Mark, I'm sorry you've had to wait so long, but we really needed to hear from our residents. I forgot why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about jet skiing. Okay, jet skis, yeah, they're fun. Um, it's interesting when I get the clicker, but uh, when I was a little younger, I actually got an appointment from Fritz Hollings to attend West Point, and he is a he was a great man. He got a little senile later on, but so I'm with. Uh, <laughs> so that's why I forget that I am too. Uh, I'm with Thomas and Hutton Engineering. My name is Mark Yotis. I live in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, over in Hidden Lakes, very very close to y'all. I'm here to give you a quick. Uh, it's about three hours of technical stuff we really dive into. So, you know, take a make, break if you want to, but it would probably be short. I mean, there's a little too much meat there that you probably don't want to be bothered with. I just want to tell you where we were. So our task was to update the sewer master plan for the island. And that's really looking at where do they go for, say, the next 20 years. And, and the Isle of Ponds Water and Sewer Commission has been working on things to improve their system here and there through a what they call a CIP, Capital Improvement Project. So every year they but they identify a project based upon needs and put aside money for it and do it. So this is to kind of take it where you would take that program and start looking at what you need on the sewer side, not the water side. Um, and it, it was a little old and if you know that uh, in the last three or four years, construction prices have really spiked. Um, and actually, end of last year was probably the highest we've seen them in a very long time. Um, they are more stable now, so they're not increasing. That's good news. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what we did and what we found. Uh, first of all, this is kind of outline of what I want to hit real quick. Uh, I know it's long, but it's real quick. We started by looking at what the population projection would be in the coming 20 year planning period. The last time it was done, it was a while back, so we kind of want to make a fresh look at that. We wanted to look at both, is it a unit count and by populations and see how those compare because those translate to flows. How much wastewater are you going to treat and dispose of and how much do you have to collect and transport to the wastewater plant? So you. You're looking at sizing, which affects cost. We also want to look at um, taking some identifying service boundaries of a basin because each one of these, you know, since we're flat, have to be collected by gravity, put in a pump station or the lift station, and lift it up and pump it somewhere. So we want to look at those and how you def define that boundary. Mm -hmm. uh, then we want to look at those pump stations, how big they were, where they might be and how you would take a force main which would transport the wastewater to the wastewater treatment plant to treat it. Um, then we want to look at the wastewater plant, of what you need to do at the wastewater plant to accommodate the flows that were projected back up in here. Both from a lay it out on the, on the site and how much storage do you need because, you know, early in the morning, everybody's getting ready for work, there's a peak come June and July, there's another peak, which is a lot bigger. So what storage do you need so that the treatment process has a uniform flow into it? Well, because up and down, you don't treat very well, wastewater very well. 
and then we took those layouts of this is the master plan of how do we we cost it did physical cost for that um, and then we projected those costs so the, the baseline was a period that we said okay well the biggest thing that we see what you would do in the next 20 years is sewer areas that do not have conventional sewer i.e. septic tank areas and and then how do you phase that under a reasonable projection and then I got a couple next steps of what we think would be what you would want me to do next and it's probably hard to read on this and that's sort of intentional but there's a lot of information here on, on and this is the unit counts so I got um, uh, miscellaneous flows, wild dunes, growth, uh, REUs, unsewered aisle, um, residents, existing residents. And we looked at a range on a, a kind of a low flow and a high flow to see where those went, to try to project out. When the island is fully built out, what is that magic flow number we're trying to deal with? Then we compared that to population projections by the Census Bureau. Um, and where do those fall in line? The results were pretty much the same. The average annual daily flow was about the same. Now, average annual daily flow is basically the total flow in a year divided by 365 days, right? And that's that's one number, but that's not the number that you might you might see that in uh, March. But in December, it's a little different. June, it's a little different. July, it's a little different. August, it's a little different, as you know. It's a tourist destination. So we want to get the baseline and then project out. And those projections, you can see them, hopefully you can read this a little bit better, but um, average annual daily flow in 2020, 1.1 million. So on an everyday basis, that's what you should get. But um, when it's fully built out on the island, based upon what we see in, on zoning and number of lots that you have, about 1.6. So this just gives you an idea of where we are. If you come down here, to us, there's two important values. There is the peak month flow, because on the island we found that there's really four months in the year that you hit a peak. And if you notice, this peak is a little bit different than the average. Then there's a peak week when it's really kind of busy, and that's even higher. Peak day is more you can, you can handle it internally, but when we're looking at being able to transport wastewater, collect wastewater, and treat wastewater, we need to be looking at these higher numbers because, you know, the people that come here are not going to, they're still going to flush the toilet. So you're still going to get <laughs> 2.8 million gallons a day compared to, on average, you get 1.6. So you see the peaking difference is a lot bit different. But that helps us size those facilities. So, um, so the purple is is if the existing customers that already have sanitary sewer service. It has a slight growth to it and it's projected out to 2034 as kind of build out. And then on top of that, we made an assumption that a reasonable schedule that you could sewer areas on the island if you so choose was to do it in an eight year window. And that's what this little rope uh, here, peak is here and then it's sort of that, you know, same parallel path that it slow infill if I want to call it that and then the tool is you've had add the two together so that's kind of <coughs> our tracking of what it would be so it's kind of kind of quick and then it's slowly because I mean, obviously it's kind of built out here um, then we took those and we did those basins I talked about and the basins were identified by these red circles like here this is basin 22 and that's because it's pump station 22 is in that basin that's that's right out here about what does that serve already? And then we got to areas where there really isn't any sewer to say, well, how can we sewer that area? And part of the criteria was to limit our depth of cut on that gravity sewer to 12 feet. Because if you go more than 12 feet, then you really get into a lot higher cost of dewatering, taking the water out of the ground so you can put the pipe in. And the trench gets a lot bigger it's more costly to restore it and it's bigger impact to the customer. So that was kind of the goal and that fell in line with what was already seen on the island as far as sizes. But that's all the boundaries and then we laid out the sewer, how it would be done. We put some pump stations in about where they would be and how they pump. And this is more of a, a zoom in on it. So the red is the boundary, 
The Burlu is what would be conventional gravity sewer, and the circle is where there might be a pump station, because at some point you got to lift it and pump it down to the wastewater plant. So not to say, okay, this is exactly where it's got to go, but this is general area that, you know, if you can get it at a good price or there's a some reason that somebody wants to give you a little piece of property, that would work in that area. Mm -hmm. And then we did a physical takeoff of all those. Um, and then we looked at, okay, so we have flows from these areas, we have a pump station. So a, a pump station, uh, blue, is a new pump station. These kind of gray, can't see them at all ones, and you probably can't see those ones either, are existing. So we looked at how we pump Wasser, because it's a long, narrow island from there down to, to uh, basically Forest Trails plant at this point, sort of center, center of the island. And you know, I focus a lot on this end of the island because obviously the wild dunes end is already sewered. So, and it's in fairly new condition, new compared to a lot of places. So, not a lot to do there. Uh, and then we took that, so we've got a, a layout of that. And now we said, how are we going to cost this? We're going to do some detail into that cost. Um, you know, what, the, what, what our markups would be, what our escalation rates would be, uh, inflation. Um, how we came up with a unit cost to say, okay, this is a manhole, where do we get that cost? You know, it's a historical cost, it's bids in the er recent area, um, but from contractors, we talked to contractors and got numbers from them, and some allowances and some potential costs, and we kind of summarized those all, all. This is an example of one basin, so you can see it's fairly detailed takeoff, uh, and it includes some other <coughs> costs. So we don't like to give you kind of the, the bare bones costs because you know a total project <coughs> has some soft costs that you need to look at to give a, a full picture of it. So we try to do that here. And there's 